Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how explanations can help epistemically justify a person's belief in a claim or output offered by another person, or in our case, an AI system. So today's conference are about issues of explainable AI in healthcare settings. And I think that this framing is a really good idea for a few reasons. Um, first of all, patient-physician relationships are like AI user relationships and that both of these kinds of relationships are epistemically imbalanced. Um, and what this means is that the information source or the explainer has access to information, skills, cognitive capacities, etc. Um, that are unavailable to the novice and this makes for um, an interesting explanatory dynamic in which the person receiving the explanation physically does not have the capacities and skills to directly verify the content um, of the explainer's claims. I'll talk about this a bit more, um, but what this means, though, is that in both cases of the AI and the physician, the explainer is a bit of a black box, which leaves us with a question of how do we peer inside? Um, so this leads, there, there are a few different strategies. One approach is quite literally to crack open the black box, go for transparency. Um, and in this case, transparency is held in a gold standard, a kind of ideal of explanation. Um, and this is a case that we see, for example, uh, in the House of Lords report on explainable AI from 2018 which concedes that full technical transparency is very difficult, if not impossible, but still maintains it as this ideal that should be um, striven for. Um, and I don't think that this is necessarily a good idea, however, um, because if we do crack open the black box, the problem, the fear is that we'll look inside and have no idea what we're looking at, um, in which case aiming for transparency is not a great strategy um, for coming up with good explanations. However, I think that we can think about explanations a little bit more like we would think about the kind of information we would get from journals um, or from the kinds of explanations that physicians would give patients. And that these kinds of explanations are rarely full. They rarely even reflect with great accuracy the exact reasoning process that went behind the final report or explanation that's offered. Um, so an example, scientific journals, um, provide a report and an account of reasoning um, that doesn't reflect the <laughs> processes that happened in the lab, um, all the experiments that were uh, scrapped and the ones that were reformulated um, and everything that went on behind the scenes. Uh, similar, a physician might not explain every single step in her reasoning to a patient, but this isn't necessarily what makes the explanation a good explanation. Um, so we can kind of think of explanations in this way more like post hoc reconstructions or reports of reasoning processes. Um, I like thinking of it sort of like the kind of report you might get from a car mechanic. Um, you don't open up the hood of your car and look directly in yourself, um, nor does the car mechanic give you an exact report of what she saw when she opened the hood of the car and looked in, um, but rather it's an account that's understandable um, and that will help you make decisions about how you want to proceed. Um, so these are the kind of explanations that we should talk about today, but we're still left with the bigger question of what makes for a good explanation. Um, and I'm going to take a few different approaches to addressing this issue. Uh, first, I'm going to start out with talking about philosophy of explanation. It's a pretty obvious place to start. Explanation is in the topic of the field of study. Um, and then from there, I'm going to move on to viewing explanations again more as these kind of post hoc reconstructions, specifically looking at explanations as kinds of justifications, um, as opposed to explanations in the traditional philosophy of science sense. Then we'll turn to look at limits on the ability of explanations to help epistemically justify someone's belief in a claim or output. Um, and then that will lead us to the conclusion. First up, explanations in philosophy of explanation literature. So for those who wish to discuss explainable AI, the wealth of literature on philosophy of explanations seems like a pretty obvious place to start. Philosophers have been exploring the nature of explanations since the Socratic era, and it would be odd to start constructing a theory of explanation anew uh, just because artificial intelligence has entered the ring. So I'm just going to provide a brief primer here of how do philosophers of explanation define and approach uh, issues of explanation. And there's a general model. First, we have the explanandum, which is just the phenomenon to be explained, like the car crashed or the apple fell. And then there are the explanands. Um, and these are just things, factors, like 
there's ice on the road, the road is curved, old tires, and then the explanation is the thing that links the two. Um, so in the case of a car crash and the fact that there's ice and curved roads and old tires, something about friction will be the linking explanation. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail here because it's not too important for the rest of this presentation. Um, there are a variety of different kinds of explanations as discussed in the philosophy of explanation literature. These are competing, competing theories, and this is by no means an exhaustive list on the screen. For the purpose of this presentation, the difference between them doesn't really matter. The more important thing to understand is what they all have in common. In philosophy of explanation, an explanation is something that exists out there in the world to be discovered. So the phenomenon, the explanandum, is observed, the car crashed, the apple fell to the earth, and an explanation describes why. The explanation accounts for the way things are, and it's arguably the goal of science to discover these explanations for various events and observations about the world. So at this point, I don't want to go any deeper into philosophy of explanation, because I really think it sends us barking up the wrong tree. As I mentioned in the introductory slides, there is something different about the kinds of explanations we are looking for when we're asking for explanations of a physician's or AI's decisions. Um, an AI system's or physician's output is in question. We're not sure if it's true, um, so it's not an observed phenomenon to be accounted for. What we are interested in finding is really some kind of justification for what we've been told, not an explanation that accounts for a phenomenon. So in the next slide, I'm going to break down this difference between an explanation and justification a little more slowly with a kind of quirky example. Um, so in this case, uh, we have three different cases. In the first case, uh, we have Newton's apple tree and an apple falls from the tree. And there's the question, why did the apple fall? Um, in the traditional philosophy of explanation type explanation, the explanandum is the apple fell, the explanandum is not in question, um, the point of the explanation is just to figure out why it fell. Um, now in the second case, we get a little bit more complicated. Newton is there and he sees the apple fall from the tree. And the question is, why does Newton believe the apple fell? Now, one way to interpret this question is um, just sort of to revert back to the first scenario. Um, perhaps by why does Newton believe the apple fell, we mean what kind of theory does Newton have for why the apple fell? Uh, but the other way of understanding the question um, is a question about how Newton came to believe that the apple fell as opposed to believing that the apple did in fact not fall. Um, so in this case, whether or not the apple actually fell is in question. But if we were to go and have talk about explanations in the philosophy of explanation kind of way, the explanandum in this case would be that Newton believes the apple fell. But arguably, that's not really what we care about. Ultimately, we care about whether the apple fell and understanding why Newton believes the apple fell may or may not help us have a good idea of whether or not the apple did indeed fall. So even getting a bit more complicated, we move on to a third case. In this one, Newton tells us that the apple fell. And, and here we are, this group of people standing outside Newton's extremely tall garden wall. <laughs> um, so we can't see the tree. We can't see the apple fall. He just yells to us over the fence, the apple fell. Um, and in this case, the question is, why do we believe Newton when Newton says that the apple fell? Um, if we go again with traditional philosophy of explanation type explanations, the explanandum is Newton said the apple fell. That Newton said the apple fell is not in question. An explanation for the explanandum would be possibly about the events leading up to Newton saying that. Um, maybe there's a causal account. Um, but again, what we're really interested in in this case is whether or not the apple did in fact fall. <laughs> um, so why am I talking about all of this? Um, well, part of the reason is that reasons that Newton could give for why the apple fall fell, um, again, might come in the form of some kind of a philosophy of explanation type explanation. He might say, well, I knew the apple fell because there's an apple sitting under the tree um, and this tree is an apple tree and I have this theory about gravity so I can deduce that the apple fell from the tree. Um, and this is sort of a deductive nomological explanation. But just as good justifications for why the apple fell, um, Newton could say, well, because it would be a rather odd thing to lie about, or because I saw it fall, do you doubt my eyesight? <laughs> um, and so this is sort of the distinction that I'm trying to get at. Um, and again, why why am I going with all of this? Um, 
Well, if we think about the group of people standing outside of the wall um, as AI users and all the stuff going on behind the wall on Newton's side of the wall um, as the inside of an AI system, the black box stuff that we, we can't really see, we don't know what's going on. And then Newton's yelling to us, the apple fell as the system output. Um, we can sort of draw a parallel to the kind of explanation, the idea of the kind of explanations that we're trying to get from AI systems. Um, so slightly less abstract example, but in the same format. <laughs> um, here is a AI medical um, diagnostic system, and it outputs a diagnosis, X. Um, what is the goal then of seeking an explanation for the diagnosis that was outputted? Is it A, acquiring an explanation that accounts for the explanandum that the AI system outputted diagnosis X? Or is it B, deciding whether to believe the diagnosis X is true? Um, in other words, acquiring a justification for the claim X. Um, and I think that quite uncontroversially um, that the answer is B. Um, whether speaking to a physician or listening to a medical AI system, our end goal is being justified in believing what the information source is saying. Um, so the aim of the explanation then is to help provide this justification. Now, this kind of justification may come in the form of an explanation traditionally defined in philosophy of explanation literature, meaning we might have to go through A to get to B, or at least that's one way to get to B, but not necessarily. Ultimately, we want a reason to believe the output, and this can but will not necessarily have much to do with what actually went on inside the black box. So in other words, for philosophers of explanation, um, the explanation is the end in of itself. It is a thing to be discovered in the world. It exists regardless of whether we find it. Um, but we are concerned with explanations as means to an end. So as a means to justifying one's belief. So to avoid confusion in the rest of this um, presentation discussing explanation, um, I'm going to set aside the term explanation for the time being. Um, we'll, we'll give that to the philosophers of explanation, we'll let them have it. Um, I actually really think it might be an unfortunate choice of words to use explanation to describe explainable AI, um, at least in philo philosophical surface, because it really points philosophers down the wrong rabbit hole um, towards philosophy of explanation, when I think what we really need to be talking about is justification. Um, so setting aside explanation for the time being, um, and what we really care about here are post hoc justifications and reason giving. Um, so I'll speak in these terms from here on out. Um, and where I do switch back to talk about explanation, just know that what I really mean is post hoc justification and reason giving, um, unless I specify otherwise. So speaking of specifying otherwise, um, one more point on philosophy of explanation. Even though I maintain it sends us up the wrong tree or down the wrong rabbit hole, it's not completely useless to talk about philosophy of explanation. There is a more pragmatic vein to the literature that yields some important insights. Philosophers such as Peter Ackenstein, Bas von Frassen, Michael Strevens, and Hank Direct all emphasize the role of explanations as communicative acts in which conveying understanding to the intended audience is key. Um, and making sure that an explanation is understandable to an audience may require stripping detail or modifying the explanation in very ways, various ways. So, even if we stick with a philosophy of explanation approach, um, understanding will be key, and this shows that in no way should a full account, um, full transparency, be held as a gold standard of explanation. However, there's still something missing. First, we still only care about explaining the explanandum, the AI system output at X, insofar as that explanation might actually help us justify our belief in X. And this looks a bit more like a question of testimony. How does reason giving help us justify our belief in what people tell us, or in this case, in what an AI system tells us, than a question of explanation in the traditional philosophy of explanation sense? And this leads us to the first big claim of this paper. We need to shift the conversation on explainable AI, and human expert explanations for that matter, away from the philosophy of explanation literature. It's not that it's useless, but it doesn't go far enough. It tells us about different kinds of explanations, it tells us the, that context sensitivity and understanding is important, but it doesn't help us decide what to do when the truth of the explanandum, the thing that needs explaining, is uncertain.
So now I'm going to switch gears and shift away from the philosophy of explanation literature and move to thinking about explanations as post hoc accounts and justifications. Uh, first, I should hash out this term justificatory value that I've introduced. So an explanation is justificatorily valuable insofar as it contains information that helps a recipient to epistemically justify her belief in or acceptance of the explainer's claim, conclusions, recommendations, etc. And here I'm using a graded notion of justification such that a, a person would be more or less justified in her beliefs. So a good explanation will be one that has a higher justificatory value. To investigate the justificatory value of a post hoc explanation, I find the literature on contexts of discovery and justification in scientific research a really useful place to start. It's not a literature often connected to discussions about what makes for a good explanation, but I hope to show that it really is quite relevant. So first, what are contexts of discovery and justification? Um, as initially outlined by Hans Reichenbach in 1938, Eight. Uh, the context of discovery um, is the context in which scientists conduct experiments, analyze data, and formulate theories. Well, on the other hand, the context of justification is where scientists communicate their findings beyond their immediate research groups, so in journals, presentations, or even in more public-facing fora. Um, there's much debate about how these contexts of scientific research can be delineated, or indeed even if they should be delineated, or can be delineated, um, but the more interesting thing here is in the initial motivation behind Reichenbach's articulation of the divide. It's the observation that scientists do not preach what they practice. The accounts of their reasoning processes and motivations as presented in journals and articles do not reflect the actual processes that took place. And this is what Uda Shikori in 2008 has called a doing-saying mismatch. So when scientists present their findings and papers and talks, the procedures they describe rarely accurately reflect the events and thought processes that did lead to the results they obtained. Rather, the rationale and methodolo methodologies a scientist reports in the context of justification are, as Shikori describes, post hoc rational reconstructions of the scientist's process of discovery. Post hoc reconstructions are idealizations and rationalizations of the scientist's motivations, reasoning, investigative processes, etc. Now this should all be starting to sound familiar. AI explanations, physician explanations, scientist explanations, indeed all expert explanations um, are post hoc reconstructions. So we have a really useful model here, which leaves us with a very good approach for thinking about the question, what makes for a good explanation? Or as understood here, what makes for a good post hoc account of reasoning? We can ask the question, is what an AI or expert says justificatorily valuable because of or despite any abstractions from what the AI system actually does to derive a conclusion? And there are two sides to this debate in the literature on context of discovery and justification. Um, first, there's the negative view, that explanations are only justificatorily valuable despite any abstractions from the reasoning process that actually took place. Um, with regard to scientific papers, Peter Medwar um, makes a very unapologetic stand on this issue. Um, and according, and he writes that the scientific paper is, in its orthodox form, does embody a totally mistaken conception, even a travesty of the nature of scientific thought. According to Medwar, what scientists actually do in the lab provides the best justification for their out for their outputs, and any changes scientists make to their report um, of what they do only do degrades the justificatory value of their account. Now, most people in AI development um, who hold transparency as a kind of gold standard of explanation would side with Medawar. The idea is that the better explanation is the one that gives us the clearest view of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, on the other hand, however, there is the more positive view um, about post hoc justifications um, in which justifications can be valuable because of abstractions that they have from the actual reasoning account. And these kind of positive views are held, for example, by philosophers such as Frederick Supp, Franklin Housen, Peter Lipton, um, and they are of the opinion that a scientist's post hoc reconstruction of her reasoning and procedures provides the best justification for the scientist's findings. A scientist will surely present her most well-reasoned arguments um, in her published works. Now, following these scholars, we 
um, might be more optimistic that AI explanations that don't give us a direct look into the reasoning process um, can provide quite valuable explanations. Uh, and this view is nicely articulated by David Leslie in a recent Turing report on understanding AI. And the gist of what he has to say um, is that AI systems fill many different roles traditionally filled by human experts, but they are designed to mimic human expert outputs, not to actually reason like humans. Yet explanations of the AI's reasoning um, still has to be accessible and digestible to human recipients. So accordingly, uh, Leslie writes that explaining an algorithmic model's decisions or behavior should involve making intelligible um, to affected individuals the rationale behind the decisions or behavior as if it had been produced by a reasoning, evidence using and inference making person. Um, so here we see a more this emphasis on the more pragmatic approaches to philosophy of explanation. We see sensitivity to the um, context and to an audience's cognitive capacity. Um, at the end of the day, an explanation has to be intelligible to the recipients given the cognitive capacities that they have. Um, and especially in the case of AI, these explanations are probably, most likely, not going to be very close reflections of the processes that actually took place inside the AI system. But this leads us to a new problem having to do with the limits on the potential justificatory value of a post hoc explanation. So as mentioned at the end of the last section, uh, cognitive accessibility is a prerequisite to justificatory value. An explanation must a present an account of an explainer's reasoning um, that's comprehensible to the intended audience and b uh, present information that the explanation recipient can use to evaluate the veracity or well-foundedness of the claim uh, using the cognitive capacities and resources that are available to the explainee. Now, even if we aside with the positive view with Lipton and Sup and Leslie and others um, who argue that explanations can be valuable because of their abstractions from the original process, there's still a tension between the comprehensibility of an explanation and the ability of an explanation to provide information that the recipient can use to epistemically justify her belief in the content of the expert's claims. Um, so in the case of journal articles, it's not so much of a problem um, because here we're talking about expert to expert communication. Um, the experts, the person writing the journal, um, and then the, the scientists that are reading the article or the reviewers that are reading the article are on somewhat of the similar epistemic footing. Um, they have similar knowledge backgrounds, similar skills, and so forth. Uh, things tend to get a bit more complicated, however, when we start talking about expert to novice communication. So the kind of communication you would get between a physician and a patient, um, any expert or novice, um, or, or between an AI system and a user, especially in cases where the AI system is slotting into a role traditionally filled by a human expert. In these cases, we have to ask the question, how justificatorily valuable can an explanation be when the explainer-explainee relationship is epistemically imbalanced? One way to enter this conversation is to look at the coherence theory of justification. According to the coherence theory of justification, uh, you're more justified in a new belief if that new belief coheres with your set of existing beliefs. Um, and in general, coherence is understood as the combination of consistency and explanatory connections. In brief, a set of beliefs is consistent if none of its members are mutually exclusive. If a new claim is mutually exclusive with your existing knowledge and beliefs, then you would be less justified in actually believing the new claim. Explanatory connections are similar. Um, explanatory connections are about how well a new belief fits into your existing networks of belief. The better the fit, the more justified you are in believing it. So what does this have to do with scientific papers and AI? First, the case of scientific papers. Even if a scientific paper doesn't closely track what actually went on in the lab, if you're reviewing such a paper, the post hoc reconstruction of the scientist's reasoning can still be evaluated for inconsistencies with and connections to your own existing beliefs about the knowledge that's already established in the field um, and with any experiences you might have with how lab work is best conducted in these areas. Now, given that scientific papers supposedly present a scientist's most well-prepared and well-reasoned justifications for her claims, if that post hoc reconstruction of reasoning doesn't cohere well with your background beliefs about the field or about what good reasoning looks like in this area, then you would be less justified in believing the end claims. Um, explanations can play a similar role in the case of AI. For example, saliency mapping 
It's an explanation technique um, that looks at what factors most heavily influence uh, the decisions or output that's outputted by the system. So if based on your background knowledge, you agree that those factors are relevant to the decision, then it's consistent with your background beliefs um, and would give you some justification for believing the output. Counterfactuals are another good example. Uh, counterfactual explanations describe how an output would change along with alterations to the input variable. Um, so if the effect of a change on an input on an output meshes with your mental model about how the world works, um, then even if that same mental model wasn't actually employed by the AI system to reason to a conclusion in the same way that you might reason to the, the conclusion, um, if the post hoc presentation of reasoning does mesh with the mental model that you hold of how input variables should, variables should impact the outputs, then you would have some reason to feel justified in believing the output. Of course, there is a glaring issue here with using coherence um, of, with existing beliefs as a basis for epistemic justification. And that is that we are assuming that the mental model you have of the world is a good one, that your pre-existing beliefs are true. Um, and this is obviously not always going to be the case. So this leads us to discuss some major critiques of coherentism. Um, first, if background beliefs are false or unjustified, then surely alignment with those beliefs is not going to be an epistemic virtue. Second, the more well-versed you are in a domain of knowledge, the greater the potential justificatory value um, an explanation can hold for you. Now, this leads us to a really interesting conclusion, um, and that is that explaining background knowledge sets a cap on the potential justificatory value of an explanation. That is an explanation's ability to provide information that a recipient can use to epistemically justify her belief in a claim. Um, and this will be the case whether the explanation source is human or AI. The source of the explanation is not our greatest concern. It's the background knowledge and capacities of the explanation recipient that limits potential justificatory value. This idea is nicely visualized as a continuum of justificatory value for expert or AI explanations based on the relative expertise of the explanation recipients. So all the way on the left here, we have expert to expert communication. An example would be a scientific paper published for an audience of peers. In this case, the potential justificatory value of an explanation given for a claim or output might be quite high. Um, and this is because the explanation recipient is an expert in her own right and has a rich foundation of background beliefs uh, against which to compare the claims and reasoning being presented in the paper. Um, however, as we move to the right hand side, um, we see that the cap on the potential justificatory value of an explanation necessarily decreases um, as the relationship between the explainer and explainee becomes more epistemically imbalanced. Um, so as we move to the right, we have maybe AI to expert explanations, um, and then moving further right, expert or AI explanations to informed novices, like a physician making an explanation to a very well-researched patient, um, or even the case of expert or AI explanations given to naive novices, like a physician offering an explanation to a naive patient. Um, and it's in this far right case that the potential justificatory value of an explanation might just be inherently very, very low. Um, and it doesn't matter how good or detailed an explanation is, but because of the limitations on the novice, uh, the explanation just can't have a high justificatory value. So this leads finally to the conclusion. Uh, this has been quite a dense presentation that has happened in three main steps. First, we discuss needing to shift away from philosophy of explanation as a model and foundation for discussing what explanations can achieve for us in the context of epistemically imbalanced relationships like physician-patient relationships um, and also many AI user interactions. Second, we turn to discussing explanations as post hoc reasons and justifications in which there's a doing saying mismatch, the difference between what went on behind the wall and what's being said on the other side, um, and whether the gap is really important at all. And finally, this leads to the conclusion that in epistemically imbalanced relationships, explanations will often be of minimal justificatory value, meaning that the explanation recipients will often not be able to use the content of an explanation to help epistemically justify um, her acceptance of a given claim or output.
Now, I understand that this is an overwhelmingly negative conclusion, um, but I think that it's a useful conclusion to recognize. Whether we're speaking of human experts or AI systems, oftentimes the limiting factor on the potential justificatory value of an explanation will be the capacities of the explanation recipient. Um, this is not a new challenge presented by AI, uh, but it is an interesting, but it is interesting to note um, that in the human case, we just tend not to think about it. Uh, but I will end on a slightly more positive note. Um, so, so far I've been discussing an explanation's justificatory value, which is about providing epistemic justification for a person's belief in a claim. Um, and explanations may not do very well on this front, but that doesn't mean that they are useless. Oftentimes, especially in patient-physician relationships, explanations play a role um, I play an important role for providing opportunity for questions, uh, making patients feel heard and providing indications of value alignment and fairness. Um, and these other functions shouldn't be overlooked. But the epistemic concern still remains. We need a way to evaluate um, whether what a system or expert is saying is true or epistemically well-founded. Um, and where explanations fall short on this front, uh, I think we should again shift our focus, um, but this time to foundations of trust in AI and in experts. As lay patients, when we go see a physician, we don't believe what the physician has to say because we were able to um, in some way verify the content of the physician's claims using whatever explanations or reasoning were provided. Um, rather, we believe that in general, we would do well to heed the physician's advice. We have reason to trust the physician, um, and it's this trust that gives us the epistemic justification for believing the physician. Of course, this still leaves the question of what are these foundations for trust? Um, how are they built? How are they indicated to users and novices? Um, but most importantly, how can we build similar foundations for trust in AI? Um, but this is a topic for another day um, and one that I would be happy to continue discussing. Thank you. Uh -huh.